a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome you to this lecture, which is going to be on social banking, and it's a great pleasure for the department. It's a great honor that uh, Dr. Atiyah Rahman has joined us in order to deliver this lecture, which will focus on climate change and social banking in Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Rahman uh, got his uh, PhD from SOAS many, many years ago and um, he, the PhD became a book and it, uh, the title of the book uh, was Peasants and Classes and was published by the Oxford University Press. It's, it's very well known, it has been used for teaching around the world and we are very proud of having him here today after so many years. Uh, if you look at uh, the work that he did in the Central Bank of Bangladesh, you will see the SOAS footprint there quite clearly. Uh, he is considered to be one of uh, very few central bankers that has focused on climate change and has uh, worked so much for the poor, uh, which is very unconventional for a central banker. Uh, if you look at uh, the debates that we are having about uh, climate change and central banking, in most cases when people refer to central bankers and climate change, do you know who is the person that in most cases they think was the first one who talked about climate change? It's McCartney. So everyone is talking about McCartney, the speech of McCartney 2015, and that McCartney from the Bank of England uh, started this discussion about how we can incorporate climate change into central banking. However, the reality is that uh, Dr. Rahman started doing that much earlier uh, he became a governor in 2009, and he put climate crisis, but also poverty, at the core of, of the things that he did uh, at the, the Central Bank of Bangladesh. And I don't think that this has been recognized. And it's not only about recognition, it's also about understanding the way of thinking that Dr. Rahman has about climate change and, and other uh, very pressing issues and how we need to, to use this way of thinking in order to rethink settled banking. Uh, so he did a great job as a governor, uh, but at the same time he did a lot of academic work. I mean, he, he has published a lot of papers in academic journals, a lot of books. He has received so many awards uh, about uh, the work that he did at the, bank, uh, at the Bangladesh Bank and uh, overall about his writing. So I'm not going to go through this, but it's a long list. And for those of you who don't know that, uh, we had the honor yesterday to, to provide an honorary degree to Dr. Rahman. So a second degree from SOAS. It's, it's a big pleasure to have him here. Uh, now, uh, before I give the floor to Dr. Rahman, I would like to say a couple of things about uh, my personal experience when I first met him Last year, uh, it was in Bangkok, uh, when we invited Dr. Rahman to give a lecture as part of a capacity building program that we uh, co-developed and co-organized uh, uh, through the Center for Sustainable Finance. So we invited him to, to give a talk, and um, there were three things that impressed me when I, I listened to, to him talking. And the first one uh, was that I never expected uh, that I would agree so much with a central banker. <laughs> uh, whenever I, I see a, a, a speech from a central banker, it's always about inflation targeting, maybe a little bit about financial stability. It could be about exchange rates, but uh, it's always the same way of thinking. So the way that uh, Dr. Rahman thinks about central banks is very different. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, he understands that central banks are part of a broader system. They have to interact with uh, the, governor, the government. They have to provide guidance to banks. They have to, to be leaders when they provide this guidance. They need to think long run. Uh, and uh, he has this, what I call, systems-based way of thinking. He looks at the systems. He understands uh, how we can manage these systems, how, what are the best policies to, to deal with uh, instabilities that arise in systems. And I think this is a way of thinking that we no longer have in most central banks around the world. So it was so great to, to see that uh, we have central bankers that think in that way. The other thing that uh, I found fascinating is that uh, Dr. Rahman is a central banker who works for the poor. He, he did a lot of things in order to support poor people, 
And on top of that, he found a way to convince rich people that this is good perhaps also for them. So he, he managed to deal with the political economy of Bangladesh in a, in a, in a very unique way. Uh, but I think you cannot find central bankers who uh, try to support poor people so much. And uh, in most cases, central bankers first look at the rich people, they discuss with rich people. I think we, we no longer have central bankers that do what uh, Dr. Rahman did. So I think that's also very important, uh, also given the challenges that we're having in front of us. And the other thing, of course, uh, is, and you're going to, to understand this in a bit, is that Dr. Rahman is, is a great speaker. Again, he departs from what is the case with most central bankers in the sense that whenever you listen to central bank speeches, uh, all central bankers try to be very careful with every word that they are going to say because they see, they, they understand that markets uh, observe their speeches, uh, they want to say some things that will create some expectations about deflation, so, th so they're so careful. And at the end of the day, they, their speeches tend to be quite boring from that perspective because you already know what they're going to say and you know that they will be very careful. So this is not the case with Dr. Rahman. You're going to see that in a bit. He has great stories. Uh, he, he, he has... Um, uh, all these very innovative ideas. He's very excited about talking uh, uh, about these ideas. Uh, so it's, it's a very uh, unconventional, I would say, uh, way of delivering speeches. So I think we have a lot to learn from Dr. Rahman. And uh, I also think that um, he provides uh, a kind of a global south perspective to central banking. I think nowadays we have that central banks in the global north dominate the way of thinking about central banking, and uh, many countries in the global south try to follow this global north oriented way of thinking about central banking. And in my view, this is a mistake. We need to have different models, we need to think in a more open way. And I think uh, Dr. Rahman has, has, has made a great contribution to that. So, Without further ado, uh, let me give the floor to, to him. Again, it's a great pleasure. Thanks a lot for joining us. Start here, then, yeah. if I want, but then I'll move. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, this is okay? This is working? This is working. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis, for your kind words and su such a comprehensive introduction uh, uh, about me. I'm humble. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Swas University of London for really providing me this opportunity of coming back after 40 years or so to take another doctorate honorary, although you know this is a, for the first time a Bangladeshi has got this award and uh, I really want to thank all those who must have worked for this. Yesterday as I was telling you know our uh, uh, we are at the moment facing a lot of existentialist challenges and the most important challenge of the time is climate change. And uh, this challenge has direct linkage with the economy and the finance. Uh, we forget to relate uh, the nature when we talk about capital. We talk about finance capital, we talk about human capital, but we never really talk about nature's capital, the natural infrastructures that really save this planet and uh, uh, also human beings. Say, for example, the Sundarbans which is a natural kind of barrier 
to the cyclones you know, that originates in, in uh, the Bay of Bengal. And it comes with force. And the Sundarbans really stand in front of that force, you know, and save the people and the resources. But we never really go back to Sundarbans after this disaster and reinvest so that the trees that have been affected, the shrubs that have been carried away, they are never rebuilt or no investment as such. We never think that as the capital gets depreciated, we account that in our depreciation our financial capital whenever we do any project. But we never count the natural capital which get damaged. They need to be really re-evaluated uh, and rebuilt. And natural capital's depreciation is not there in the mindset of the economist nor the policy makers. So I thought as a governor which, who deals with finance, but I thought I better deal finance, not for finance sake, rather do it, uh, you know, deal the finance for its ultimate objective to improve the standard of living of the old people. And I strongly believe that it's not the finance for a few, is the finance for many, which Adam Smith said in, the, in his earlier uh, you know, and ideas on capitalism, that you need to really have the finance for many, not for a few. If you only work for a few, you have all the chance to really work for an ugly finance, I will tell you. But the good finance is for all, you know, the finance for everybody. Of course, the rich will take advantage of the finance, but it's a regulator's job is to convince the rich that if you are investing on the people, on the base of the pyramid, the house will be stronger. And if you are operating on the top floor, you will still remain secure if the you know, if the pyramid, uh, the base is stronger. So I thought, you know, best thing is to invest in people, you know, first. And then increase demand for the rich. Actually, the rich are the people who run industries. They create, you know, product, consumer products. But if the people don't have purchasing power at the bottom, you know, who buy your book? Uh, goods. So that is an you know, intrinsic interest even for the rich if you really go for financial inclusion. That's why back in 2009 I started talking about financial inclusion. The moment I talked about financial inclusion I thought I also talk about green finance because financial inclusion will mean also finance for the environment, finance for, you know, people who are being affected by the disasters. So we created this, uh, you, know, you know, idea of financial inclusion, uh, uh, which can lead to financial stability. And I have seen, you know, I, I really don't want to uh, boast, but uh, from 2009 onwards, you know, during the period uh, I headed the central bank, we witnessed one of the, you know, steadiest uh, economy. And the, it was so stable. The inflation was coming down. The exchange rate was stable. The reserve was going up. But at the same time, the share of the farmers in borrowing, in, in, in loans was increasing the bank accounts for the you know uh, the farmers increased there are some bangladeshi audience here that they know about this 10 taka or 1 cent accounts i gave and i asked the banks to give 
one cent account to the farmers, you know, and they won't charge any more. It's a corporate social responsibility. We really promoted corporate social responsibility so that every farmer gets a bank account. And if you want to give any, 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 any subsidy or any relief to the farmers, go by the banks. But go by the accounts because they now have a bank account. They never thought of having a bank account. You know, they dare to go to a bank branch. But then I thought people around this time, 2009, I'm talking about 2009, not at this moment. We have a lot of digital knowledge now. We can do many things. But I somehow thought the you know, the uh, mobile uh, sets were coming around that time. So if we can use these mobile sets for finance, then we can reach everybody, you know? People then carry banks in their pocket. But they didn't have a smartphone around that time. So then I requested the, uh, you know, uh, uh, telephone operators, uh, uh, like uh, uh, the Roby or the Grameen and all that, that you give them a code called USSD code, you know, Yanis. So we uh, asked them to give code so that, you know, non-smart mobiles can also operate as a conduit for financial transactions. And that revolutionized. I gave the circular in 2011 for the mobile financial service. Now, at the moment, uh, 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 nearly uh, 20 uh, 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 200 million uh, bank accounts are really on the mobile set. So people are taking money. Uh, the rickshaw pullers are banking. Even the beggars are banking in Bangladesh because of this, you know, that financial inclusive step we took around that time. So these are the stories I'll tell you in a more structured way. Uh, please bear with me as uh, Yanis has made my life a bit difficult because he has spoken so high about my human banking. I wish I can live up to your expectation. But let me start with the initial slide. You know, you can see uh, uh, that You can, you can see for yourself that Bangladesh uh, is one of the uh, most disaster-prone countries in the world. You know, uh, this is uh, 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 a country which experienced frequent flood, cyclone, and droughts, and whatnot. You know, it is ranked as 10th in exposure and 5th in risk among the 15 countries with the highest exposure and risk levels associated with climate change. And uh, yet it has maintained a 6% annual growth rate over the last uh, couple of decades and strengthened financial inclusion for many years, actually. Uh, this has been made possible through innovative approaches to addressing the climate change and disaster management, and that too, you know, led by the central bank. I thought this was quite heroic in the sense that, you know, people were initially very worried that here is a central bank governor who talks about only farmers, the poor people, and not so much on inflation. Of course, as I told you, we have really put the gene called inflation into the bottle, you know. When I was the governor initially in 2009, the inflation rate was 12%. But in five, six years time, we brought it down to five or around five, you know, five percent. So we continued the, our strategy for financial uh, you know, inclusion, but also looking at the macro policies which really also controls inflation. So we did it both ways. And uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, Bank, that's why it was awarded, the governor was awarded twice as the best governor in Asia and uh, Asia Pacific. So because of these uh, financial inclusive measures. And disaster uh, management was an 
important uh, area where central bank really uh, uh, provided uh, finance and uh, made uh, banking more humane. Uh, as you all know, uh, Bangladesh is right now going through a very difficult time called you know, uh, uh, unprecedented flood. You know. Again, this flood is also a climate change you know, you know, uh, 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 product in the sense that there was a cloud bust you know, in the area near uh, Bangladesh and uh, Tripura, about 70 uh, kilometer area there was a sudden cloud bust. As you may, I'm sure many of you know what is cloud bust, you know, when concentrate, you know, the cloud concentrate and suddenly get bust and the rains come for three days, continuous rain in the area. And then that really created the flood and the water from the upstream also started coming. The, the gates of the uh, uh, embankments had to be open, you know, and uh, water really came. But... What happened because of human interventions on the uh, riverbeds, and uh, you know the water could not flow. You know the, the the rivers lost its you know you know depth in most of the places. So the f water got spread, and the f uh, flood was so bad. And uh, but what I really wanted to really uh, uh, tell that the, this flood originated from climate change called cloud bust. So that's what is, you know, uh, uh, this flood uh, has been uh, climate change induced and it has got huge impact on the economy. The, besides this human cost, colossal human cost, you know, the crops, the fisheries, livestock are all gone in that area. You know, the, uh, the, the, the fisheries ponds have been overflown. Uh, uh, the livestock's all, all mostly dead, you know, because there was no place to keep even the human beings, you know. School, colleges, offices became the flood shelter, but uh, you could not take the uh, cows and, and livestock uh, up uh, there. So many of them died, and even those who have been taken into a higher ground, they didn't have any food. The livestock food was not available, and many of them died because of the hunger, you know. So that is the, uh, there was a power cuts, disruption of telephone, internet, and transport shutdowns, and these really have huge impact on the supply chain, you know, and the supply chain got disrupted. Although, uh, you know, uh, 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 people immediately responded for relief, but that's, uh, it will take a long time to repair the, the infrastructures and all these enterprises, they have been affected. Particularly the small and medium enterprises have all been devastated. So you need now the kind of banking that we did. You need more financial inclusion. You need more fund for the downtrodden. If you really want to you know, uh, recover the losses that we have uh, been <coughs> uh, put to by the, by the, by the disaster. So I thought there is a huge link between disaster and the kind of financial inclusion I'm talking about. So uh, as I told you, this cloud uh, burst uh, 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 which uh, has happened, and uh, uh, this is a directly a climate change uh, 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 phenomenon. Uh, again, as I was initially telling you, that uh, unless we put nature into our thought process, we'll always underestimate uh, uh, the uh, production or the GDP that we count, actually. No. Uh, uh, GDP does not reflect the increasing ecological damage. You know, it, you know, the, the, we only, uh, conventional GDP accounting only take financial or the human, uh, you know, production or human kind of uh, uh, ingredients. Uh, but uh, by now, as, as I told you, uh, climate change has been very, very frequent. So there is a huge cost of that climate change. And this need, be, need to be integrated into the depreciation of the natural capital. And uh, unless we do that, 
will not get the real picture of production and, and the GDP, will not get the uh, GDP that we want to know. Uh, developing countries like Bangladesh have been over-exploiting natural resources. You know, uh, I was talking about Sundarbans. Also, you know, Indonesia, probably many of you know how they over-exploited their minerals and also the forestry, you know, and, and uh, 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 at some point in time, the GDP was more than average of the developing countries. But in reality, when they, uh, you know, now see the impact of the damages, the natural uh, damages, uh, when you come, you know, there is a huge, uh, uh, you know, difference between the effective GDP and the GDP that has been counted. So I thought uh, climate change has given us a new kind of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, knowledge and also an imperative to look at the GDP from a more comprehensive uh, natural, human, and financial perspectives. So what is expected? If you really want to have a climate change uh, uh, friendly uh, development. Uh, so what do you need to do is to, you need to avoid short termism. Account for eco ecological damage has to be taken because you just only take the short term kind of uh, damages or the impact, but you need to look long term. Say for example, uh, what happened to the forestry in Indonesia? Or if you really irrigate a lot your groundwater goes down. So for a year or a two, you can see a lot of food production going up, but you are losing in the long run. So that's why avoid short-termism is one thing that we must uh, really uh, uh, think about. Look for long-term management of natural, human, and financial assets, and live on nature's income instead of depleting its capital. So you'll have to you know, uh, recover the losses in the natural losses and rebuild the nature so that the new development paradigm uh, is, uh, will be really uh, actually focusing on the nature's uh, in a, in a imperative. And that's what is so important, the relationship between climate change and financing. As uh, uh, Ianis was telling, this is a quote from Barry Eichengreen in 2021, I started this kind of thinking back in 2009. So uh, as I said, I have not, uh, I think I gave a lecture in Barclays, I remember there I mentioned about it, but uh, fortunately he has written about uh, uh, the role of climate change in the monetary uh, policy. Uh, uh, the role of the central bank can be critical in pushing this new paradigm I was talking about. Aichen Green says, monetary policy has implications for issues beyond inflation and payments, including climate change and uh, uh, inequality. The best way forward for central bankers is to use monetary policy to target inflation while directing their regulatory powers at other pressing concerns. So I was exactly doing this. You know, we, we are not you know, uh, unaware of the macroeconomic challenges in terms of uh, containing inflation, but we were also really careful about poverty, where inequality, and the impact of climate change. So we made a, a developmental central banking, I would say. Uh, and uh, uh, we started this back in 2009. In fact, even in a bulletin, actually, you know, recognized Bangladesh as a pioneering you know, uh, 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 central bank uh, to talk about sustainable finance, in fact. Uh, so uh, I thought, thanks God, at least the mainstream economists now they are coming forward uh, to talk about climate change. So this shift in paradigm I was talking about, if you really want to understand this shift, you'll have to really understand between the conventional approach and the financial inclusion approach that I have been uh, pushing. Uh, the conventional approach is more broad-based, uh, 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 but essentially based on uh, financial sector. 
You know, it's finance for finance sake. You know, uh, but financial inclusion paradigm prioritizes financial inclusion for holistic development. So that's the difference between uh, the two approach, actually. You know, uh, and now, as I said, mainstream economist also recognizes this. Uh, the financial inclusion is being highlighted as key aspect of financial sector development and uh, uh, in turn development of the economy as a whole. I also wrote a paper, I think uh, this was in 2013 or 14, I don't remember, uh, in AFI, Alliance for Financial Inclusion, an organization which I was a founder trustee of that organization, the Malaysian governor, Indonesian governor, and myself, we were the uh, Filipino governor. So we were the trustees of that Alliance for Financial Inclusion. It's in Kuala Lumpur based. Yanis knows about AFI. So there I wrote uh, inclusive sustainable finance leads to stable inclusive growth. So financial inclusion can lead to financial stability as well. You know, Yanis was talking about financial stability. Of course, financial stability is very important, but the financial stability will not come unless you spread the money. You know, if you only give, say, 10 people, 10 billion, one of them fails, that means you have about more than 10% uh, non-performing asset. But if you give 1 million people, even if few thousand fail, your NPL or the non-performing loans will still remain low. So that's why financial inclusion is so important even for you know, financial stability. So we need to link finance with sustainable agenda. That's the issue we are supposed to talk uh, uh, today. So how do you link this? We need to combine short-term business fluctuation management with long-term sustainable agenda. Uh, we need to ingrain socially and environmentally responsible financial ethos, reflecting local context and global challenges. The ethos, the ethics, these are very important issues. And 2015, really, uh, the world came to a moral compact called Paris Agreement, if you remember. There, actually, the whole world agreed that we must work together for climate change challenges. And in finance, we must work together also to address the climate changes. So we need to enable the bottom of the pyramid through financing sustainable entrepreneurial innovations. You know, if you have more innovations on the ground, if you have more small entrepreneurs on the ground, you know, the economy becomes much more stable and much more uh, 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 anti uh, uh, poverty oriented. You know, in, in Bangladesh, uh, you know, there was a huge gains in poverty reduction. You know, it's not only because of the fiscal policy. It was one of the policies that the central bank took. You know, not only uh, through uh, the banks, but also lot of microfinance institutions in Bangladesh. You know, these are also regulated institutions. And the central bank governor is the chair of the regulatory body of the MFI. So I could easily, you know, develop a bridge with the MFIs by being the chair of their, you know, microcredit regulatory authority. So then we, I remember I created a, a, a linkage program. I told the bank that you can give wholesale credit to the microfinance institutions for agricultural loans, and they will take the mine money to the ground, you know? So you don't have to r run for the uh, farmer's loan. The, the, those who are experienced, have the uh, rural outfit, let them do it. I, I tell you a story, then you will understand. Uh, I uh, uh, made a uh, regulation that every bank be it foreign or local, have to provide two and a half or three percent of their portfolio, the loans portfolio, to the farmers. The Stanchard Bank, you know, you know, they don't have any branch in the rural areas. So they came to me, uh, the, an American CEO, he came to me, Governor, how could I do this? I don't have any branch in, 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 in any of the areas. How could I do this? But you have made it a compulsory that you'll have to do it. I said, 
if you don't do it then what i'll do i'll take away the money you put in your reserve you know in in our reserve fund i'll take away that 3% of the money and put it in another uh, account where i'll not give you any profit so if better do it i said then how do i do it i said go and sign an mou with a brac or any other microfinance institution they will do it for you in the first year they didn't take it seriously and what they did when it came out that they could not fulfill the you know target i just took away the money and put it into the another account but not only that i told the central bank to write a letter to the stanchard head office that your uh, you know uh, uh, bank in in bangladesh was non compliant on one area and the ceo got mad sir this is so important my career is gone i said give me back those money i'll i'll i next year you will double the money on agriculture i will then uh, tell that you have become compliant and that's how and they got the message every foreign bank every private bank started complying and this became this has become one of the most important areas of uh, you know uh, 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 f- uh, loans for even the foreign banks the stand chart now tells me sir you have done so much of uh, 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 benefit for us i said why the money we put in for agriculture 99% come back but the money which we put in for other sectors they don't always come back you know there a lot of non performing asset there so in agriculture the farmers are very keen and they really provide and I, we are providing the money through the linkage program you have you know innovated so th- that kind of innovations has really helped bangladesh develop uh, this uh, 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 new kind of central banking as ianis was talking about so the role of sustainable finance we are talking about it has to be environmentally sustainable socially responsible and also inclusive remember it has to be inclusive if you are not inclusive you cannot be sustainable so that's the message we need to give financial service providers hold the power to prioritize environment friendly uh, endeavors over others thanks to their intensive interactions with the clients they are well informed about the ground realities and they can inspire and encourage clients to follow other successful green enterprises they are the knowledge brokers the bankers here is a banker i know the bankers are the first gate out say you know any entrepreneur would first come to a banker say that i want to really do a, this new uh, investment can you suggest which could be the best way to move ahead and if that bank, banker becomes a knowledge broker he said no why don't you try something which is more sustainable which is more green you know greener so then he immediately gets the message so i really what was my challenge was to green the mind of the bankers and that i did you know with the with the with the, with the bankers will you will you uh, you will be surprised to know this governor went out outreach to the villages 200 plus times as a governor it was a world record no other governor ever went out of their office and to the villages so many times so that's how and in, in a couple of times i took the managing directors or the ceos of the private banks who who are suited but you know they never go to the villages i said let's move and we had a long you know you know you know uh, uh walk and talk you know uh in the villages with all the ceos following the governors and we are working in uh, walking in the rural areas that was a real in you know, a good message in the television was uh, you know telecasting live program that the governor with the ceos move, moving around the rural areas to find how the you know you know you know financial inclusion was taking place so that that those are fun actually i tell you and it really changed the mindset of the bankers that we need to touch the ground not always put the money in helicopters so uh we need to go beyond short termism as i told you you know uh, because short termism uh, the conventional model you know uh, they increases inequality and encourages waste threatens environment and miscalculates gdp as we have seen so we got to really now uh, 
uh, uh, focus on the issues of environment and society. So climate change, resource scarcity, sustainability, these are the core areas of the finance and a central bank should really focus on this. Uh, uh, again, the green economy that we, we are thinking of really promoting will lead to really more equity and security of the future generations, you know, if we can take that. In fact, uh, 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 I really promoted a lot called corporate social responsibility. You know, we asked the banks that you got to, you take money from the citizens. What the hell you do for the citizens except for few entrepreneurs or the rich as Yanis uh, uh, was taking. I said, you need to again take away about certain percentage of your money and put it for the core social responsibility. And of that CSR fund, at least 10 to 20 percent should be earmarked for the disaster management and climate change challenges. So now this has become uh, the, and a, and a central bank is pursuing even today this uh, CSR fund for disaster management and climate change management. So the uh, sustainable development concerns and the new role of the financial sector is that you know, we need to really uh, uh, have to respond to the call for large-scale mo mobilization and mainstreaming of the environment social concerns that we are seeing. And uh, the uh, concept of sustainable development has to be reframed uh, uh, the conventional relationship. So move towards climate resilient growth supported by sustainable finance. And uh, fortunately, I was one of the 11 uh, 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 member global committee on designing sustainable finance by UNEP. You, know, you, you browse through designing sustainable finance by UNEP. I was one of the 11 members, and you know, I was from the developing countries. The other, mostly others were from the developed countries. And we designed this sustainable finance model. Now the whole world is moving in that direction. So uh, uh, now again, uh, uh, given uh, this uh, concept on sustainable finance, how we are looking at the global finance, the non-conventional finance. Uh, in, uh, I'm talking about global economy that uh, uh, recently went through the steepest kind of challenges because of the COVID and the war in Ukraine, as you have seen. You know, the lot of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, the largest economies, US, China, Euro, still under pressure. US appears to be doing a bit better than others. You know, recovery is there, but the inflation is still in a high, and they are not really re releasing the the, the uh, uh, money that uh, uh, is supposed to be done. And the tightening of the monetary policies are synchronized across the board in West. You know, even the UK, uh, the France, and others are also in the same mode. Uh, but the US, uh, it is still uh, doing, although doing better in terms of employment, uh, but they are still in a tightening mood. You know, and, uh, and for that matter, uh, uh, actually, prices remain still high. Even if the inflation comes down, the prices can still remain high. I'm sure many of the economic students would understand why I'm telling that. Because, say for example, there was a 10% inflation. Of a, you know, that means your community prices were 10 plus and higher. Next year, your prices, uh, inflation has gone down to 5%. But this 5% is above that 10, tuck, uh, 10 uh, cent, you know? So it is 15 now. So prices is not coming down, although inflation is coming down. So one has to understand that, that macroeconomic challenges that the West and the other countries are facing because of the inflation, you know, is still uh, you know, hurting the ordinary people who are really you know, uh, uh, feeling the pressure on their parts. You know, you know, so that's very important. So consumer confidence dropped more sharply and, uh, 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 than any other previous recessions. So global economy is still in turmoil. And added with that now is uh, your geopolitics. So a global economy is set to receive 
uh, in a recover is only uh, moving very slowly. If you have seen the global growth uh, of the 23-24, uh, to be projected to be 2.4 percent by the World Bank, and uh, uh, this uh, will likely to improve to 2.7 percent in the next year and 3.1 percent uh, the year after. But the pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic, it was 3.1. Uh, so growth remains constrained due to elevated interest rates, tight financial conditions, and uh, <coughs> uh, uh, slowing uh, trade and subdued investment. So uh, 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 global economy is still in trouble, uh, although uh, uh, inflation has moderated, but it still remains elevated in many countries, and a situation could further deteriorate if there is more geopolitical tensions. There is always a, 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 a tension uh, bringing up in China and also uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. See what is happening uh, around Gaza and, and, and the tensions building up there. So all this will have impact on the macroeconomy as well. So a challenging time for emerging market as well. It's not only the you know you know the, the Western countries. The, the 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 challenging time is also for the market economy of the developing countries. The recent tightening of monetary and the fiscal policies will likely prove helpful in reduction of the inflation. But because they are highly synchronous across countries, they could be mutually compounding in tightening financial conditions and steepening the global growth slowdown. Policymakers in emerging market and developing countries need to stand ready to manage the potential spillovers from the globally synchronized tightening of the policies. So uh, this is a uh, quote from uh, uh, Acting Vice President Ayan uh, Kos. So again, uh, 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 we need to look at the entirety. Is no finance is not only for finance things. Even geopolitics comes in. You know, and uh, 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 synchronous tightening. If if the tightening was done by say UK, not uh, uh, the France, then it would have been different. But then all done together. You know, that's why there will be an impact on the developing countries as well. The the import price will go up, and that's what has gone up, and that will have also uh, an impact on the inflation in a developing country as well. So. Uh, uh, there is a need for a concerted action from a variety of policy makers at the moment. Uh, the central bankers in advanced economies should keep in mind the cross-border spillovers effect of the monetary tightening, and those in emerging uh, develop and in developing countries should strengthen regulation and build reserves. And many countries you know, are unmindful of improving the reserve. I was happy during uh, my tenure as a governor Reserve was really growing constantly. I started with about six billion dollars as my reserve, but when I left in, in six, seven years' time, I left 32 billion dollars as reserve. So that really gave a lot of strength of the economy. That even doing financial inclusion, you can improve uh, in a in a reserve. How? The farmers are the ones who earn more money, uh, 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 more dollars, I would say, if they were producing more. You know, that means we don't have to import uh, rice and we'll not have to spend dollars. And also, the children of the, of the farmers, they go to the Middle East, they go to other countries, and they send remittance. And they're the ones really are the strength of the economy of the developing countries, the remittance heroes. So I thought, and I, I really wanted to really, uh, in fact, I, in fact, uh, uh, you know, gave a reception and also uh, regularly awards to the best of the remittance earners it, around that time, you know. So this was, this was uh, uh, again, a financial inclusion of a kind, actually, if you really work for the remittance earners. The finance fiscal authorities also need to carefully calibrate the withdrawal of fiscal support measures, uh, uh, should also put in place credible medium-term fiscal plans, and other policymakers must work to ease labor market regulations to boost the global supply of commodities and strengthen the global trade uh, <coughs> networks. Unfortunately, our uh, 
labor market got balkanized you know because of uh, the geopolitics you know uh, china bashing and many other things really uh, 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 balkanized the globalization that we saw and the impact of globalization was huge in terms of reducing poverty but for some reason as you all know this is not uh, really moving in the same direction so uh, uh, around this time uh, uh, there is a uh, feeling this is for former world bank uh, uh, president uh, melpas he said to achieve low inflation rates currency stability and faster growth policy makers could shift their focus from reducing consumption to boosting production policy should seek to generate to generate uh, 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 additional investment and improve productivity and capital allocation which are critical for growth and poverty reduction these are essentially you know investing on the ground and for the uh, uh, the lower uh, uh, level entrepreneurs so sh need to shift further uh, 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 towards resilience and sustainability and uh, energy is an issue that should be taken more seriously. Many of the macroeconomic uh, the challenges that countries like Pakistan or Bangladesh or many other countries are facing because of the energy. The energy cost has gone up. And again, most of the countries, uh, as you know, recently uh, 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 and Pakistani uh, economist uh, uh, Atif Mia has re uh, written a lot on the challenge of high cost and a fossil fuel based energy uh, uh, plan that Pakistan has taken and that is causing a huge in Bangladesh also you know we have really given a lot of incentives to the fossil fuel rather than to the renewable energy and that created lot of macroeconomic imbalance actually current account balance has been badly affected and we really don't know how to handle this in, a, in the long term so uh, this is uh, untapped recommendations that tax the excessive profit by energy companies to fund social protection programs all countries must manage energy demands accelerating transition to renewables and finance for green energy transition must be scaled up and the uh, 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 Secretary General of the United Nations, he supported if the UNCTAD's recommendation related to energy are pursued, such policies must be strictly time bound and targeted to ease the burden on the energy poor and the most vulnerable during the fastest possible transition to renewables. So there is a global kind of imperatives now to go green and to really become more sustainable. So there has been a uh, seismic shifts in shipping roads caused by uh, deglobalization, geopolitical unrest, and you can see that trade-related disputes between China uh, and USA and the war in Ukraine and the latest unrest in Middle East all indicate, as I told you, balkanization of the global economy. And that will have a lot of impact on the sustainability as well and uh, and many of the loading ports are used to export uh, uh, will change to avoid tariffs logistic providers will need to serve more diversified trade routes for each of their clients if the uh, you know uh, uh, middle east becomes really hot in terms of you know in a po geopolitical tensions uh, so global supply whips and shipping routes to undergo accelerating changes in the next five years due to concerns related to resiliency and geopolitics so i thought these are uh, the areas so we need to really look beyond short-term geopolitical concerns and of course we need a green transition, digitization, and automation. And these will be the fundamental drivers in the longer run. And now I'm moving towards Bangladesh, just the perspective I gave you. 
These forces will alter the role uh, of uh, labor uh, uh, arbitrage plays in manufacturing location decisions, and these are likely to cause more changes in the next five years than the world has undergone in the last 20 years. So it's not only a Bangladeshi issue or a developing country; it's a global issue. You know, you know, we are moving into very uncertain, you know, areas, and uh, we need to really put our uh, 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 feet on the grounds and. Uh, be more uh, in a, in a forward-looking and long-term thinking. So, so far, uh, our perspective, the global perspective. Now let's move into Bangladesh, which I will be moving fast. Bangladesh Bank has been promoting inclusive finance, particularly in the wake of the global financial crisis 2008 to 9. In a, uh, I became governor and the early 2009, I, on the very in a uh, 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 hotbed of global financial crisis around that time. So our job was to make financial service accessible to one and all, leveraging uh, digital solutions to ensure re reliable, low-cost services. We gave attention to underserved segments, agriculture and uh, uh, micro and small medium enterprises and prioritizing women entrepreneurs. Uh, environmentally benign green output processes uh, were also promoted for sustainable development. And as I told you, we tried to touch the ground to change the real economy for people living at the bottom of the social pyramid. The driving force has been the focus on socially responsible finance for more inclusion. So we really wanted to touch the ground rather than fly high. You know, that was our uh, 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 policy. Of course, we, we are not oblivious of the monetary policy because monetary policy, we focused on experimentation and implementation while being mindful of what monetary policy can and cannot do. Our monetary policy was price stability uh, uh, was the major uh, you know, objective while supporting output and employment. Uh, also, institutionalized sort of a new emphasis on the quality of monetary policy implementation, monetary and fiscal sector policies uh, prioritized inclusive, environmentally sustainable growth, thereby fostering medium to long term macro financial stability and widening the economic base. So that was our uh, uh, you know, monetary policy. You'll be surprised to know, Yanis. I, as a governor, I put in financial inclusion and sustainable finance into the monetary policy text. People were surprised. They said, why are you are writing all this? I said, this has got direct implications for inflation management as well. They said, how? I said, if you, you know, we only look after uh, inflation from, uh, uh, you know, demand perspective. So we reduce demand. Re uh, uh, you know, raise interest rate, policy rate, and uh, make it difficult for people to really spend money. But I said, that will not help much unless you also produce more. So that's why I started giving money for spices, giving money for agriculture, and through private banks even. Even uh, we created a lot of fund uh, uh, in the central bank to give refinance to the banks so that they go for this kind of supply chains bolstering. And we had, in fact, we, we attacked inflation from both sides, from the demand side and also from the supply side. That's why uh, it became stable very soon. As I told you, it started with 12% inflation, but then brought it down to uh, in a, in a, in a, for 5% in, in a five, six years time. So you need to be much more in a, in a, a pragmatic and innovative, uh, even in monetary policy, there is a uh, possibility. Monetary uh, policies are not uh, the way others think about. It can be innovative. So monetary policy statement, we, in the statement, we used to go beyond just setting targets. You know, inflation targeting is not the only way to really uh, 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 organize the monetary policy. 
so we started upgrading infrastructure, digital infrastructure, so that you know implementation of the monetary policy becomes easier. If we can have the infrastructure, digital infrastructure, online information reporting, RTGS, you know, uh, 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 automatic clearinghouse, national payment switch, electronic fund transfer, electronic bond market, my mobile financial. These are all innovations that we did around that time, you know, in a digital innovations we did in the central bank. And we, at the same time, we raised consciousness, uh, uh, gave guidance circulars, financial literacy, stakeholder consultation. Every monetary policy I used to give, I used to talk to all the stakeholders, not only the bankers, before I gave the monetary policy, actually. You know? So everybody knew that what is coming as Yanis said, our economy is still 80% informal. It's only 20% formal. Market probably would penetrate and change 20%. But the rest 80% need to be addressed innovatively. And that's what we try to do, actually, from that. So we need to have prudent policy support. We had camels rating, differential equity margin equipment, and market development agenda as well in, in improving the quality of the monetary policy. So uh, the developmental central banking, I call it in Bangladesh, uh, as an early starter, I don't know, this concept may not have been uh, uh, put forward so much at the moment, but I used to talk about this, the challenge that uh, uh, global financial crisis uh, we thought uh, we need to really bolster the demand from the below and also supply from below. So that was our idea. And Bangladesh Bank opted for a broad-based financial inclusion campaign. And uh, our strategy was to reach the bottom of the pyramid, finance agriculture, promote SMEs, women entrepreneurs, green growth. And we got a strong outcome, you know, a strong macroeconomic basis. Our reserve enhanced, inflation control, investment accelerated in that period I was talking about 210s, you know, and uh, a strong financial sector enable government to provide stimulus packages in the COVID period as well, because we had a lot of stability in the financial sector around that time. But unfortunately, that didn't continue. I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, uh, Bangladesh financial system, an agent of sustainable economy. This is not my uh, slides. This is a, a slide by uh, Gerald Epstein, a review of the Keynesian economics, is an economist from the University of, uh, 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 is, is not in MIT, in Boston, Boston, one of the universities, you know, uh, so, Massachusetts, you know, Epstein from Massachusetts. So uh, he wrote that Bangladesh is a, is a pioneer in the sense that it has uh, uh, inclusion, financial inclusion as his campaign, promotion, uh, promotion of agriculture. Even, even we, did gave a, we designed a credit for the sharecroppers. You know, Yanis was telling that, that Suas had a footprint in my thinking. Of course. I was doing a thesis under Terry Bars here on peasant economy and uh, differentiation of the peasantries. And around that time, I saw the sharecroppers or the tenant farmers are the wretched of the earth. Nobody, nobody give them money, nobody give them contract, nothing. So I thought, as a governor, I must really address them. So I gave hundreds and thousands of the sharecroppers money through credit, uh, you know, break. You know, I really, the central bank signed an MOU with the BRAC. Nowhere in the world central bank would do that. But I went, and it was not easy for me. The board was, the, with, the, with the bureaucrats were so unhappy with me, because I said, these are the poor people, and you are giving central bank money? I said, yes. And the finance secretary said, no, this money will not come back. We will not agree to that. So I had to postpone the board meeting. I was the chair of the board, you know, of the central bank. So I postponed the board meeting. So I told Bragg that, can you give me a bank guarantee that you will get the money returned any time? So they brought a bank guarantee. I put it in my pocket. Next meeting, I went again and wanted to really uh, pass the agenda on sharecropping. The, the, the finance secretary was equally you know, you know, outspoken. I said, what do you want? You want the money back? Of course we want the money back. Take it. I put my guarantee and showed him, you take the guarantee, the money will come back. 
So then he had nothing to say, and we got the you know, sharecroppers about uh, about a million of the sharecroppers got more than 500 to 600 crore every year under this you know you know uh, arrangement with the central bank and BRAC. So that's how we created new kind of central banking, I would say. Uh, so then uh, SME credit programs, uh, well done. There was no department called SME department in Central Bank. There was no department called agricultural department in the Central Bank. We created this. Uh, we created financial inclusion department. We created, you know, the sustainable finance department in, in the institution, in the, in the Central Bank. I think Yanis can uh, vouch with me. No other Central Bank has all these departments. In the, in the central bank, the departments called sustainable finance, the financial inclusion, agriculture, SME. I don't think many other central banks would have those departments. You know? So then we had this uh, in a green credit support. We created a lot of green credit support and women entrepreneurship. In fact, women entrepreneurship was so successful. This was discussed in your House of Commons in, on the 8th of March 2015 that Bangladesh is a country where central bank is giving money to the women. And so one should really uh, look at the women entrepreneurs in a, uh, like, like Bangladesh did. So I'm so happy that it happened here in, 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 in uh, UK. Uh, the industrial policy, especially the cluster approach, we think, and guiding green development. These are absolutely, uh, Epstein has uh, you know, done a case study on Bangladesh, and he's telling how Bangladesh has been going, going green in terms of of an inclusive in terms of uh, development. So agriculture finance is being consistently prioritized during those period. I, for the first time in 2009, I gave a policy called agricultural loan policy. There was no policy. Anybody could do anything. But then we created a policy where what kind of fund should be given, who should get it, what, how, how this will be evaluated, how this will be monitored. So we gave a policy and we get a target. Every year a target is given and they increase it and look at, and this is consistently moving up and this year it is uh, even higher. So uh, I thought uh, uh, the uh, 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 trusting uh, uh, the farmers, putting money for them, has been a great innovation by the central bank in, in Bangladesh. Uh, uh, see the results, the timely step to safeguard the same, same sector amid the pandemic industry. Even during the pandemic, you know, we created uh, a credit guarantee scheme, Cortis Micro Small Enterprises, and 80% uh, 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 of the uh, uh, principal amounts, single loan will be, uh, you know, these are the innovations of operating the agricultural credit and also the SMEs and uh, uh, how the guarantee limit will be worked and how they are moving. They, although they are slow, but this is an innovation that credit guarantee scheme has been created for the farmers and for the SMEs. Uh, and microfinance is another area we don't talk much. Now the microfinance guru is in charge of the Bangladesh, so I'm sure uh, this will get more uh, uh, emphasis uh, in, in the coming days. Uh, but I have been a champion of microfinance for many years. I was the chairman of the Credit Development Forum. All the microfinance institutions have a forum. I was the chair even when I became governor, before I became governor. So when I became governor, I became the chair of the regulatory body of those microfinance. So it was, for me, easy to link the two, actually. And we created this linkage program. Thousands of crores of taka have been, gone, have been uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 channelized to the microfinance institutions through my intervention, I said banks that give the wholesale credit to the MFIs, they will take it to the you know, ground. And that's how you see the microfinance is now increasing all, you know, how, how this is going up. Uh, over the last decade, number of MFI borrowers have increased at a compound uh, rate of 4% to 36 million. Annual disbursement has increased at a, uh, 16% to over uh, uh, 2 trillion taka, and the recovery rate is almost 100%. So 
it's better to invest on them because they return the money. And then, and they are big numbers. And that's how the poverty reduction takes place on the ground because these are the people who work on the ground. So look at, again, another innovation I did. You know, this was something... It came out from my head because when I was a student, you know, uh, Kamal was also in our uh, 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 public school. We studied together. Their Ogruni Bank, you remember Kamal? Used to, one of the banks used to come to have a school banking. We used to have small account in the school. But that culture was gone. But when I became a governor, I said, why don't you bring that back? Let's have, you know, uh, every school uh, children should have a bank account. And, and, and the bank should give at a very low cost. And if they put a deposit, there should be an incentive on that, one or two percent more than the conventional banking. That's how we created this school banking. And uh, this is again customer uh, uh, in a, in a, uh, a confidence uh, between uh, uh, 20 to 21. Number of accounts increased from 2.26 million to 2.67 million, about 18 percent. And the amount deposit also increased from 16 billion taka to 22 billion taka, 37 percent increase. Currently, there are 2.8 million accounts and 22 billion taka deposit in the school bank accounts. You know, can you imagine? And these are the children who will have, when they are 18 plus, they can have their own enterprises out of their own deposits, you know. And this is a long-term deposit. The banks are very happy because the children, they put the money, they don't take it away immediately. So they keep it for a few years. And it's good for the bankers. So I thought another sustainable measure is that, you know, for school banking, and I'm so happy. Not only school banking, I have innovated bank accounts for the street children. And this became a, in Yanis, if you see that, Guardian carried a full play story on that. The central bank in Bangladesh goes uh, uh, to give accounts to the street, street children. You know, these are the children who are in the street. You know, they don't have their, you know, an address. They don't have, they are not really recognized by anybody. And uh, whatever money they collect uh, through work in the in the marketplace or that, they put it in here. And in the evening, you know, somebody comes and take away the money. So I said, why not? They should be given a bank account. In the evening, they should put the money in the bank. At that time, mobile bank was not there. So I said, put the money. So I asked the central bank to, you know, open bank account for the street children. Believe it or not. The central banker said, sir, are you, have you gone mad? I said, why? Well, you know, the, the law doesn't allow that. I said, why? Because they don't have parents, they don't have an address, and they don't have any guardians. So how could they have a bank account? I, was, I said, Do send it to the lawyer. The lawyer said the same thing. Then I was very frustrated. So I said, send it to another lawyer. And I will talk to the lawyer. So once they send the file to the lawyer, I call that lawyer. I said, this is governor speaking. The lawyer was very happy to receive my call. I said, this is a problem. Can you show me an innovative way? How can I include this wretched of the earth in the banking sector? He said, no way, sir. The law doesn't allow. I said, what is the problem? They don't have any guardian. I said, Suppose I became their guardian. So what happened then? Sir, sir, what you are talking about? I said, so what I'll do, I said, what I'll do, I, uh, I will ask some NGOs to foster them. You know, they will open account on their behalf, like the, you know, uh, Save the Children or the, you know, organizations like them. And if they do it, Will you be happy? He said, oh, yeah, that's fine. I said, write it. So I approved it. Next day, you know, the street children started getting account. That was a big revolution, I would say. And, and, and this uh, guardian carried a big story out of it. So that's how we became more humane as a, as a banker. And these are the, and I, as a governor, I remember I sat with them in an iftar party. You know, they were so happy, sir, our money is protected. You know, you know that's how we used to do uh, 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 this kind of new banking. So 
this is another area we have uh, improved on the financial uh, inclusion for women, you know, commendable achievements. Financial gender gap decreased from 29% uh, to uh, uh, 6%, uh, you know, and uh, uh, you can see that how we measure policy initiatives we took for the women in Bangladesh. Uh, you know, no free accounts for RMG workers, uh, training of women for entrepreneurs, simplified loan application, uh, and uh, recovery, 25% of the COVID recovery refinance scheme for women, and prefer preference of women in agricultural uh, uh, and cluster development, dedicated refinance scheme of 3,000 for women. And so we created those funds. And we, had, we asked every bank to have a women desk so that the women entrepreneurs can come to that desk and tell their problem. And that's how they will get the money. And they got the money. You know, you know, uh, that was something we did. So all this was possible because we went pretty fast on uh, digitization of the uh, 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 central bank. Central bank was a very archaic kind of central bank, you know. You know, they didn't have any digitization. So my job was to also modernize this bank, you know. And these are the digitizations. I'm sure I'll not go into it. So we had integrated supervision system in place. We had uh, credit information bureau digitized. We had, a, you know, a check processing through uh, uh, switch and uh, 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 electronic fund transfer, RTGS. We have KYC modernized, you know, and digital financial service, online banking, mobile financial service, agent banking. All these revolutionized the access to finance for the ordinary people. As I told you, even the beggars do banking these days because of the mobile financial services that we have introduced. Uh, in a Bikash, you may have heard about it's a fortune, uh, uh, you know, Forbes uh, 50 uh, companies works for these ordinary people actually, you know, in Bangladesh. And that regulation too, the mobile financial regulations, I gave it again. It was in my hands, you know, that they got these regulations. So digitization has revolutionized access. Now 4% increase in the number of bank branches, 44% increase in the number of ATM, 85% increase in the number of registered mobile, 161 increase in number of uh, 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 money account, mobile accounts, and 82% increase in the value of mobile money. And this all happened in, in in, in these five years. In fact, started my period, but it accelerated also later. So you can see the green policies. Now I'm coming to the green policies. Evolving green policies, Bangladesh Central Bank started very early, 2011. We gave this green banking guidelines for the banks. And in 16, uh, we gave a sustainable finance units and committees in the banks and uh, financial institutions. 20 sustainable finance policy and a methodology for banks, and by 22, about a 4 billion Taka refinance scheme for green bonds have been approved. So this is a, uh, the key features of the Bangladesh Bank sustainable finance approach, or green approach, is that the green financing approach initiated in the post-global financial crisis period in 2009-10. Uh, we are very pioneer. A sustainable finance policy we have, uh, and also green term finance we have, uh, determining green sustainable finance targets by the banks, specific shares for sustainable and green finance, 20% of the total funded loan for sustainable finance, and 5% of the same for the green finance. This is a mandatory given from the central bank, and uh, the banks have to go green around that. And Bangladesh is committed to reduce uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions by 6.73% unconditionally from business as usual levels by 2030 or a conditional 15% reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emission from business as usual levels by 2030. So a lot of things are happening in the banking sector on, on the uh, uh, green uh, financing areas. And we also have a policy of rating the banks how green they are sustainable ratings, we call it, uh, uh, in the central bank, you know, uh, uh, and uh, 
uh, uh, the each year top 10 person, uh, uh, 10 banks and top five financial institutions are being rated as green best uh, economy. I started that process and this has now become institutionalized. And uh, uh, green bond uh, financing for banks, uh, th there is a, uh, uh, a policy move on that direction. And ESG, or the environment, social, and governance uh, 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 ratings are also going on. Uh, and they are incorporating in the decision-making process of the banks and the financial institutions. And you can see the green finance disbursement, how they are increasing. You know, this is going this way. There was a stop in 2020, but again, this is going. Total credit going for green finance has increased, uh, and sectors covered include renewable energy, uh, waste management, recycling, agriculture, and CS. I mean, 90 products. There are 90 green products, and the banks can give green credit, and these are low-cost credit because they get refinanced from the central bank. So we started that process, and now they are more institutionalized. Uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the products, green products. These are the products. 47% are environment-friendly establishment, environment-friendly brick production, manufacturing, recycled goods. You know, these are the products, you know, green agriculture, CSME, green uh, uh, sustainable renewable fund, renewable energy, and energy efficiency. So a <coughs> lot of innovations have gone in uh, green finance in Bangladesh. And these are really to uh, address the challenges of the climate change. And the huge results, you know, leading manufacturers are responding very positively to the green finance drive. In fact, we started in the central bank this green finance drive for the, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing. Suppose uh, if, if you know as a Western consumer that this product done in Bangladesh has been done in a green approach way, I think you will be happy to really put your coin for this. So that's why I really uh, took an extra initiative and called a green transformation fund we really created so that the factories go green, you know? And you'll be happy to know that today, as many as 200 plus RMG factories have received LEEDS green certification, you know? And of that, 733 have platinum rated and 113 have gold ratings. And all of them are now think 500 of the factories are in the process of getting LEED certified. They're applying because they know there is a future. It's, as I told you, must think long term. If you are thinking sustainable finance, you must think long term. And these are the long term kind of processes that we need to go ahead. So Bangladesh Bank's roadmap, we have, now we have a Bangladesh roadmap for sustainable disclosure, uh, full disclosure, you know, guidelines for reporting uh, the disclosure and limited disclosure, limited supervision reports, and then finally the full disclosures. And uh, you all know, uh, I'm sure Yanis uh, 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 knows this better, that international finance reporting standards of IFRS S1 and S2 Bangladesh is the country which has opted for it. Not many, even developed countries have opted for it, but Bangladesh has opted for this reporting structure. Bangladesh Central Bank is one of the first in adopting these standards and set forth by the International Sustainable Standards Board or uh, ISSB. So Bangladesh is moving in a green direction. And uh, uh, Vice Chair of the International Sustainable Standards Board, ISSB, said that we want to thank the Central Bank of Bangladesh for its efforts towards uh, spearheading the phase in adoption of the ISSB standards for banks and financial institutions. Bangladesh has a unique opportunity to steer the way across the Asian market. You know, this is uh, uh, so rewarding. So private commercial banks are already producing their own sustainability reports now because we encourage them to go green so much. So uh, uh, Citibank is, is a very well-known bank in, in Bangladesh and has publicized their first ever sustainability report in 2022 titled Towards Net Zero. So this is something, a private bank doing this. You know, we have encouraged them so much. They have adhered to the Global Reporting Initiative standards of 2021. The report covers a period 
uh, a broader standard than used in the usual financial disclosure. It has also integrated reporting on UN SDGs, where the bank has a direct role in achieving progress. And the bank has reported 83% growth in the green finance and Bangla Bangladesh took 8.4 billion total disbursement in green projects in 2000. This is a case of one uh, uh, bank, you know, which has become one, number one or number two in the green rating, the top 10 uh, banks that we go, one of them is that. The, another bank which is, is doing very well, this is called Bragg Bank. You know, they are also doing pretty well in, in green uh, achievements, has also publicized their first sustainability report in 2022 titled Banking with a Purpose. You know, they have also adhered to the Global Reporting Initiative standards. This is the first bank in Bangladesh to be endorsed by the ISO 27001, 213 certification. <coughs> it is also the only member of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values from Bangladesh. This is a, a London-based association, as you know. I was once invited online to talk about the Bangladesh value-laden banking that we have introduced in the, in the country. Uh, Bangladesh Bank's green drivers drives in, continues. You know, we now have green transformation fund for export-oriented businesses. I really uh, brought in about two hundred million dollars from the World Bank around that time, and uh, we put in the extra from our own account. And uh, we now have about five hundred million uh, uh, dollars. Uh, got three hundred euro also. Then we have one thousand crore technology development fund support. Uh, to green technology development, sustainable finance policy for ESG risk management, and clear directives, as I told you, 20% of term loans for sustainable finance and 5% for green businesses. We are piloting a uh, 55 million US dollar green credit guarantee scheme to finance environment friendly brick kilns. This I started with the ADB fund, I remember, is continuing, uh, Asian Development Bank fund. And uh, uh, we also now have a uh, fund for municipal waste management, clean stove production, and rooftop solar uh, 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 solutions. You know, these are uh, a new kind of areas we're working on. These achievements have been largely, of course, overshadowed by certain governance failures in the recent years, including regulatory capture. I'm not going to elaborate on You are all aware that at a, uh, 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 the political economy of Bangladesh and uh, uh, some of this uh, fantastic progress have been overshadowed, you know, but uh, I would uh, uh, tell you strongly that central bank is still on it, actually, you know, because these are mostly related to the, you know, small entrepreneurs and the poor people's uh, banking, so not much disturbed on that ground. The rich are the you know, uh, doing ugly banking, you know, un ugly finance. So that's something uh, we'll uh, talk about later. So, however, there is enough ground to be optimistic, even in the changed context. The credit guarantee schemes for promotion of all green finance product are uh, 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 based on the lessons learned from the ongoing pilot initiative. We are really thinking in that line. Solar irrigation pumps. This is an area where we can put enough money for uh, uh, solar irrigations and uh, saving 8.8 .8 million liters of diesel annually if we go for solar irrigation pumps. Uh, and there, people are so innovative in the chore area. The chore area means it's an island area, you know. They have now mobile solar irrigation pump. You know, what they do, you know, they mount it on a van, you know, a rickshaw van, and then put the machine on, they irrigate one plot, then take it to another plot. You know, that's the innovative, and, and the solar panel on it. Can you imagine the, how innovative the people of Bangladesh are? And they are, they are the, uh, my source of greening of the economy, I would say, if we can touch those people, you know, this, the poorer people. Uh, and uh, we need to ensure proper incentives for household level users of the solar rooftop. In Bangladesh, they have a solar rooftop solution now. But problem is that they're not giving it to the individual flat owners. You know, they're only giving to the you know, companies you know, and the firms. So what I would suggest that you spread it over 
to the individual uh, uh, plat plot owners as well as the, uh, the farm, uh, you know, uh, 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 flat owners, and give some incentives. At the moment, you know, the net operating uh, system is there, net meter system is there. So, but what they do, you know, if you buy it from the conventional source, you give 10 taka. And if you also buy it from the renewable energy, you also give 10 taka. And suppose I want to produce my own renewable energy a bit, and then I want to sell it to the grid, national grid. I should be paid 12 taka, not 10 taka. Only then I will think that there is an incentive in it. So these are the challenges, you know. Uh, 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 we just wanted to know the challenge. This is a channel. The fiscal incentives are not well done. They don't understand that these are two ball games, and one has to be really incentivized against the other, and that's missing, still missing in in Bangladesh. Uh, again, the IMF is making available about 1.4 billion dollars from the Resilience and Sustainability Facility called RSF to support Bangladesh's ambitious climate change agenda. But unfortunately. Even IMF is putting this money for the budget support. The ones you put in the kitty, you know, it doesn't really come to those uh, flat owners who want to buy a solar panel. So how to really reorganize even the IMF fund for the small entrepreneurs and uh, you know, those who want to go green? I think there is a scope. They can easily do it through partnership with NGO or like the one I did with the Bragg Bank on the, on the sharecropping. So this is possible, and one has to be done. And the banks can really find their partners, and a partnership really matters. So challenges on the way of accelerating green finances. Uh, again, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Yanis, for really raising this issue. Our fiscal policy is still anti-green, I would say. Look at the high total tax incentive on imported machineries for solar energy project is a major fiscal barrier, even today. You know, for solar panel, they need to pay 26%, and uh, solar inverter, 37%, solar panel mounting structure, 58%. Can you imagine? It should have been zero or one person at best. If I were in charge, I would have put it one person or zero, so that you know you really incentivize the green uh, in, a, in a product, so that they produce more green energy. So removing these taxes are likely to reduce setup costs by eight to eleven percent. So you can you can really have a lot of innovations if you can want to remove. Again, other challenges. So green finance drive in Bangladesh could be further accelerated through coordination between the fiscal and the monetary policy. This is so important. Look at this. You know, we acquiring land for large scales, uh, you know, renewable energy projects remain a challenge. We don't have enough land. So then we have to be innovative. Take it to the chore areas. Take it to the highways, you know, side by side highways. So you can be still innovative. Put up all the rooftops of the, you know, schools or the colleges, and, and that's how you put in more green energy, it's possible. So we need to be really more innovative on that. And monetary and fiscal policy for R&D uh, 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 has to be done. Innovation, you know, research and development, not much there, you know, actually. Uh, incentivize net metering, which I explained already. More incentive is needed to encourage green factories and housing projects for the IMF's RSF facility from there we can bring in. And again, bureaucratic uh, local and international hurdles in releasing global green funds. As you know, ZF fund and other funds, they're highly bureaucratic. And even a, a government, even if they want, you know, it's not easy to get that from, uh, from the global uh, funding agencies. The loss and damage we have been arguing for many years, but in, on implementation, we hardly see that happening. There are a lot of international and national bureaucracy sloppiness. You know, that really, you know, constrain the release of the green fund, international green fund. Disproportionate incentives to conventional energy production, including capacity charges, may have made uh, renewable production un uncompetitive. Kamal would know. You know, we have given so much of incentives to the, you know, big, uh, 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 I would say, uh, weeks, 
you know, who are close to the government, you know, they have been incentivized to import you know, LNGs. They, they, they are incentivized to have private production of the electricity. Whether they supply or not, they get a capacity charge. So it's a, uh, against that, you know, small entrepreneurs with a with a solar panel, they are struggling with 58% of, of taxes. So there is, a, there is a huge, and these are all tax-free. You know, the, the big ones are tax-free, and the, and the small ones, 58% taxes. So this disproportionate you know, incentive structure really withhold the you know, you know, green production of the energy, and that really hampers green transformation of the, of the fund, actually, uh, uh, so, we are almost there, you know. As the climate crisis worsens, too many people are swinging from denial straight to despair. Despair is as dangerous as denial. And it is equally false. Humanity has enormous resources under his command. And by applying them wisely, we can still prevent ecological catacombs. Yuval Noah Harari, a historian, and a, and a bestseller book, the surprisingly low price tag on preventing climate disasters. This is uh, an area we still have uh, a lot of things to do. And I think yesterday, as, as Ianis, I was telling that we must put our knowledge into uh, uh, the uh, nature's gift so that together we have a better and a greener world and a civilization, and that is possible you know, if we work. And the central bank uh, has a very important role. I was the only governor who participated in COP20, uh, and uh, uh, while this uh, you know, uh, sustainable development uh, program was uh, uh, prepared. And I used to speak a lot, because I was the only governor, and I, there I said, uh, you know, quoting Tagore, that, you know, those who, you know, leave behind, they will pull you behind. This is a Bengali uh, uh, poem he wrote, that if you, if you leave behind, they will pull you behind. So that became a tagline for the SDGs, as you all know. So I thought more central bankers should be involved in the COP, uh, uh, COPs and also on the global uh, sustainable finance and central banks are really the one of the greatest innovations of the world, and they can still work for the green finance. I, I thought so. Uh, thank you. I thought it was a, a, a long lecture, and I'll be uh, welcoming the questions if you want. Thank you. Thank you so much for the fascinating talk. Uh, what, what I found very interesting is that you had all these ideas and you always found a way to make this happen, <laughs> despite all this resistance. Yeah. Uh, I, I think most people would say, you know, there is, this is not politically feasible, so let's forget about yeah. it, you didn't. I think that's, that's very important. You need to really remain engaged, you know, yeah. and hang on. So uh, we have time for, for discussion. There will be also drinks uh, after the Q&A, so please stay with us. Uh, Sorry for a long lecture. I thought, you know, <laughs> a lot, lot of things to say. So uh, we have a few questions. Would yeah. you like to respond to each one of those? Yes, or each one of them. Okay. Let's go. Huh. Elisa, please go first. Yeah, Elisa. Yes, thank you very much for a very engaging talk. And actually, it, it's, it comes on the back of... Yanis's uh, own remark that you led on so many new initiatives and you kept going and you, you, you managed to uh, produce all these innovations in, in central banking practices. My question is, how did you develop the skills within the central bank that were necessary and within the banking community more broadly? Because you, you had the ideas, but then people have to be able to come on that journey with you. So how did you shift the culture? How did you manage to change the practices within the organization and within the banking sector? Thank you, Eliza. This is a very in, in, interesting question. Uh, as, as Yanis has started, my footprint in SUAS helped me. Because I worked on peasantry, on the uh, you know, tenant farmers, and how the uh, farmers are not really treated in, in the macro structure 
So the moment I got this chance of, you know, running a central bank, I said, I will really reach them. So that was my kind of mission. So, but then when I started speaking about this in the central bank, when I, I joined the central bank, the central bankers were really baffled. They said, this must be a weird governor. Why he's talking about, you know, financing agriculture, SMEs, women, and not talking so much on inflation. So then I explained to them the way. I said, if you do more inclusion, ultimately you will have more stable economy. Your inflation will also come down. So fortunately, uh, uh, we had a lot of young officers in the central bank, and I reached them directly. So first reach them and change their mindset. I used to work in my uh, uh, you know, office with the small officers, not with the deputy governor. Sort of the, so I started working with them. And uh, I innovated a program called Foundation Training. You know? What they do, this uh, uh, first timer, they would be trained. And uh, uh, normally, governors never go f into those kind of training. So first day training, I would inaugurate all the time and give them this message that you are really a central bank officer. That means you have to be ethical. You have to be you know, inclusive. And after, say, about two months training, it was about uh, four months uh, training or six months training, I don't remember. So after about two months training, I said, let them go to the villages for two, two weeks. So many of these girls and, and, and the boys from the urban areas, you know, they never went to the village. I said, no way, you'll have to find your way out in the villages, find a place where you can stay and come back with how the, you know, you know money we are sending in the, uh, for, the, for the sharecroppers or for the agriculture or SMEs or the women are, are really, are they getting there? Or somebody is taking away the so get me a report after you come back. And when they come back, I told the organizer that I will be the governor will be sitting with them when they report back. So groups will report back. So it was both way. You know, these are the boys and girls who really remolded their mindset because they have gone to the ground. And for me, I got the ready-made information, what is happening. So together, it became a very mindset-changing exercise. And uh, uh, this really helped, actually. Another way of changing the mindset, after I became the governor, as I told you, I could not communicate. You know, so they are on a different agenda, I am on a different agenda. So I said, this is not going to work. So let's go out. After two weeks, we went to Jomuna Resort with the, all the high officials, directors and above. Took them for three days of, you know, you know uh, 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 absolutely uh, exclusive kind of exchange programs, you know. So on the first day, I went to a group. And I saw the group is not talking because they are not used to it. You know, they are very hierarchical. And the deputy governor with a tie on and, and all that are sitting there, so they are scared. They don't want to speak out in front of the deputy governor because they may be penalized at some point. And I said, what happened? Why are you not talking? They are not talking. I said, oh, I remember. Oh, deputy governor. I said, deputy governor, you open your ties. You know, put, put, become one of them. And I give you the guarantee. Nothing will happen to you. And you can speak out anything. What are the problems? And, and, and uh, he will be entertaining you. So the deputy governor got my message. And all of them started talking. On the third day, when we were finishing, everybody was talking. And, and they, uh, uh, say, they made a demand that we must come back, sir, every year. And that's how this, uh, you know, you know, these retreats became a, a way of changing the minds. And I used to make uh, hundreds of, you know, you know, field visits. I myself went to the villages, and there the officials, the bankers would pursue me. And uh, that's how we changed the mindset of the bankers. That was a fascinating experience, I tell you. 
Thank you, Dr. Rahman, for uh, sharing the first-hand experience of your uh, execution of policies and making banking for the masses in not just the product of the classes. So that is uh, quite commendable. My question to you is uh, about the points which you really touched up in the last two slides, uh, especially on uh, uh, developing green energy. And uh, my research goes on working towards distributed energy goods to support social equity in energy transitions. And I, my research reflects a big financial gap because none of the financial institutions are ready to you know, fund projects without 100% collateral guarantees and beyond 100%, they overprice the, uh, you know, the entire project itself. And because of which, the energy distribution which is, can lead to many positive impacts like you know, forced labor migration can be reduced and uh, you know, microprocessing industries with the farmers could be developed outside with energy availability. And uh, there are many other advantage, benefits which I noted. Uh, how do a central bank guarantee, uh, you know, uh, help create a guarantee instrument that can uncollateralize this kind of green assets and uh, farmers can get more access to developing their own energy systems? That's my first question. And my number two question was relating to the SDR allocation. As a central banker, do you think that the, these new SDRs, which uh, IMF is forcing not to use for, you know, uh, uh, basically funding the green projects and stuff like that, but uh, only on the resilience and sustainability, and, and which has a definition? So what is your view on the SDR? So that's, those are my two questions. Okay, the first one is that, you know, you are absolutely right. You know, uh, uh, unless central banks comes forward with a kind of funding support, you know, that the banks uh, will have a refinance. You know, what we did, we created a fund within central bank so that that money we gave to the bank, that said, the, said that you are not giving from your own pocket. You really take this money and give it to the people you know, you know, who are going green. And you don't have to uh, uh, charge so high. You don't have to do the conventional guarantees and all that. In addition, the central bank has created now a guarantee scheme for the small and green. You know? so, that's how, again, uh, 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 we give the incentives, as I told you. We rate the banks according to the they go green. If the number one says uh, Bragg Bank or the Citibank, when it is publicized that Central Bank rated uh, you know, Citibank as number one you know, green supporting bank, that gives a lot of miles to them as a brand item. And uh, that's why they get interested. So incentivizing uh, the cent uh, bankers uh, uh, through refinance and also ratings probably has changed their mindset a lot. You know, that's, that's what I say. Secondly, on the IMF, as I said, I'm equally concerned about this RSF fund being given only for the budget support. It's like a black hole. You know, if you're putting the money in the budget, you never know whether this money will go for an entrepreneur or will go for a mega projects, so-called mega, mega projects supported by the political clubs, you know, uh, who may not really reach the ground. So I thought the, uh, the, 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 uh, we should really make a strong demand that IMF should really reorganize this RSF fund in a manner that ADB has done. ADB has given a special fund to Bangladesh Bank, which money we went for the green brick production. You know, the, the fund, which we then share it with the NGOs or, or the partners, and then we go green bricks. Uh, and and uh, uh, this is possible. JICA, you know, after the Rana Plaza, JICA came to me, said that, you know, the factories must be made green. You know, otherwise uh, it's becoming uh, like this, you know, the burning uh, and the no fire safety and all that. So we immediately created a new fund on the, on the disaster management fund and uh, it worked. So I thought Central Bank has a, a lot of role in greening the mind of the bankers. Thank you. Thanks. I think we have at least two more questions, please. I think it was first, but it's fine. Yeah. Thank you for your speech. Um, I want to focus on your policy actions because you'll be criticized for not going far enough or not doing enough. And uh, I'll focus on two policy actions. So you said that credit was allocated 25 to 3% to farmers or the COVID relief fund 
25% was allocated towards women. How do you derive that number? No, we started with a number, but uh, uh, we innovated as we moved forward. It could be less or more. It's given the targets are given by the banks, actually. We leave it to the banks on a consultation that we really want to move in, how much you can really provide it. This is the limit, you know, that we need to reach 25% at least on a green. So uh, the banks then really work it out and then come back to the targets. And once they get that target, we really monitor that whether those targets are fulfilled. For that matter, you need to have improved institutions in the sense that you need to have the desk, help desk that we created. In fact, in Bangladesh, you know, I uh, uh, created a customer interest protection center. So if suppose you are an entrepreneur, you are supposed to get this money uh, with this kinds of rate of interest and the facilities you are not getting. You can just, you know, dial 16236. I still remember the hotline. You just Dial 16236, somebody will record it, and the central bank will then uh, jump on the bank if they were uh, uh, giving the money uh, on the terms they, they promised. So that's how you create, you know, it's a learning by doing approach. And I thought central bank in Bangladesh has it became a very participatory central bank. I, I left central bank about eight years back, so I cannot guarantee that same thing is still on, but uh, what I see on the figures, the green f uh, fund is still moving. Thank you. Hmm. Yes. Thank, thank you. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of making uh, two questions. But firstly, I'm grateful that um, it seems to me you didn't have um, political intervention from finance ministers and what have you as, as, as one would normally, I suspect, in a developing country like Bangladesh. Uh, um, so I won't tell you that. <laughs> of course. That, this is what As he said, you need to be foxy. How to avoid that? Exactly. No, no, I, I do uh, appreciate that, and I just hope the audience <laughs> realise that as well. But now my two questions are, firstly, an e economic question. You mentioned, you know, uh, Bangladesh annually has 6%... GDP growth, yeah. uh, but it's at the cost of the environment, national capital. Yes. What's your estimate of the actual cost of the uh, natural environment? I don't have the estimate, but certainly a certain percentage will have to be reduced, actually. Mm. You know, uh, if we uh, take the kind of effect of the flood that we have seen today, this year, even if you want, you cannot have growth rate of 5-6%, it will have to come down because yeah. one-third of the economy is underwater and a lot of economy. So I thought those are the things you need to foreshadow in calculating growth and which is still missing. Okay, great. So I'm glad I've got a second question hmm. lined up. Uh, the second one was actually you mentioned the remitters. Yes. Uh, I mean, essentially, they're seen in Bangladesh as uh, labour exports. They earn hard currency. Um, and it's, it's, it's very useful uh, for Bangladesh. But um, could, could not more be done with, with them? Uh, for example, sure. a lot of them, I mean, for example, naturally, send, when they send their hard currency back, it's to the homes, um, uh, to the family and, and, and what have you. But very often, they, they, are, they are generally interested in measures... Uh, in the village, infrastructure, and things sure, like this. Sure. Um, I, I've seen it done, uh, the Chinese have done it, the Indians have done it, even the Mexicans. Uh, I've just not seen possible progress in the Bangladesh context, because I just, from what I see from the Middle East, where most of it's coming, and also America, there, there seems to be a willingness to, to pay for some of that. You're absolutely right. You know, uh, I started uh, 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 working with the, uh, these remitters, you know, myself, when I was a governor, and I was very popular among them because I used to send officials. And at that time, digital technology and the digital finance was still not in place. So it had to be physical. So I sent many of the central bank officials to, say, Dubai or to Abu Dhabi or to Riyadh. You know, they would go and they would go to the, you know, you know, the camps they would work or the uh, places they stay, and they would tell them that if you are sending money through unofficial channel, probably you will get one or two taka more. But you never know where that money ends up with. 
that might money might go for you know you know you know uh, uh, smuggling that money may go for terrorist financing so better to give the money through the government channel or the or the uh, 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 official channel and the banks and they were very happy so nobody told us this and they started really uh, following the banking channel but then came the uh, digital financing and now that mobile financial services apps all are working is so easy to really get them on board that they send the money through the official channels but the problem is you know it's not their problem it's a problem with the central bank the problem is over the last couple of years i would say because it's very uh, torturing for me to criticize my own bank you know over the last uh, couple of years or few years you know they were not following the dictum of the flexible exchange rate so they kept the exchange rate low when the market rate was quite high so you know the unofficial channels galore because if you, if you send money uh, through official channel you get 110 taka but if they send it through unofficial channel you know they get 113 or 14 taka per dollar so how can you stop it and that was the fault of the central bank you know they should have become market determined i have been telling this i have written so many pieces as a former governor but even then they really didn't care you know they kept the even the multiple exchange rates you know one for exporters one for importers one for remitters you know this doesn't work and exactly that created a lot of problems for the remittances and uh, 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 central bank really now corrected it uh, and and the remittances is going up at the moment you know uh, but again how to do more as i said if i got a second chance of governing again the central bank what i would have done you know i would have uh, given this remittances a special status in the sense that if they Uh, 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 come to the airport. They will be welcomed like a official guest. Then they will be given a transport to go home. You know, the, we will ask the bank to give that because this is the corporate social responsibility for it. And then, if they really go for a building construction, they will get. the housing finance at a low rate because they are remittances and the social protections given for the school children for say for example an scholarship for a girl of a village girl the remittances girl daughter should be prioritized so that's how you bring in the incentives and this will work i tell you they will bring more money Thank you. Please. Yep. Hello, Atiyo. Nice to see you again. Was there any policy that you wanted to implement but that you did not manage to, or you were prevented from doing so? No, uh, not exactly. As as he asked me a question, you need to be a bit careful in in terms of dealing with the government. The governments are an amorphous kind of quantity. You know. You know. The bureaucrats are the real kind of. obstacles you know they create more problems than even the politicians so uh, what happened say for example this share cropper uh, funding that we introduced you know uh, for 6 f- years I, as long as i was there this was uh, it went well but since i left this has been stopped why because some people in the government think that you know Uh, the central bank should not support the ngos why the ngos are also working on the ground you know is rather if you partner with them your fund goes to the field better so why not this partnership but unfortunately that fund got snapped and i'm so unhappy about it that it should have continued actually you know uh, again uh, i i wanted to now getting a bit political but never mind you know uh, i really didn't want that the there would be two regulators in terms of running uh, the banking system you know the private banks in bangladesh are 
under direct control of the central bank. So they can do anything, anytime the board can be changed and all that. But the public banks, you cannot do anything directly. You have to go through the Ministry of Finance. And there is a division called banking division. Now they call it financial institution division. They should not be there. And I opposed it. As a central bank governor, I wrote a letter to the finance minister that don't create this division because this will interfere my regulation of the public bank. So they didn't, and there, there I failed. And uh, they created this division, and that became the center of political patronage. And that really went against the interest of the, of the central bank. And I gave open... Uh, you know, in a talk, I said there cannot be two rules for the banks in Bangladesh. Either the central bank will do the whole thing or take it away from the central bank. So, and the finance minister would say, no, we, it will be like as it is. And there is to be television scrolls. Governors say telling this, the finance minister telling this. But we could not really bring that back into central bank. And now the current governor is also telling in my own in the same language that there should not be double regulations for the banks. And uh, the public banks have become the center of all kinds of irregularities at the moment. Even the private banks, some of the private banks, because of the political uh, uh, interventions. So I was quite happy. There were interventions, I tell you. But I had the guts to tell that I could not do this, you know, and uh, saved many of the banks. In one, just I'll give you one example. Suddenly, I found one of the best uh, CEOs of a, of a private bank suddenly removed. I said, this cannot happen. The central bank must know why he was removed. So I gave a regulation that no board can remove a CEO unless the central bank clears it up. It has been explained why this is happening and a notice should be given, two months notice should be given to the CEO and uh, uh, we will do the due diligence. Only then we will give the permission and we saved a couple of uh, CEOs uh, uh, in, that, in that manner. So I think a lot of things can be done if you are well uh, intentioned and you have the guts that you are central bank. I really, uh, to tell you the truth, most of the times I got through, but in many times I got caught as well. Uh, you, know, you know the story. So just because I wanted to become an independent central bank governor in a developing country, I had to pay the price, but I keep my head high. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, we have almost run out of time, but we can have one last quick question. Sorry, I became a bit emotional, but you know the story, you know, that's why. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Uh, my first question is, Bangladesh's uh, foreign re forex reserve is significantly low for the last few years. Um, the pandemic is there, and there are many other factors that played a big role. But at the same time, the mega projects, uh, the, the projects that are undergoing, you talked about energy systems, and uh, like the solar power plants, they're they are being taxed, whereas the big power plants, mm -hmm. there, there are no tax. But if I remember correctly, uh, those rental power plants, that started during 2009-10. And um, the and current, I mean, in, in the last 10 years, it's kind of the energy security, I mean, energy production has been significantly been increased by establishing uh, mega power plants. Uh, but at the same time, all those new power plants are fossil fuel based. <laughs> and that is impacting the climate change, of course. And at the same time, uh, those power plants uh, are built with foreign, for, foreign loans and many loans, I, I mean, in the, in the recent few weeks, there are reports that um, many billions of dollars are due for these uh, power plant projects. So how do you think uh, this could be minimized uh, no. in terms of green tr the transition and at the same time not impacting the economy? Because the forex reserve is significantly low, and the government is, of course, yeah, there's a new government, there's new challenges are there. But at the same time, 
uh, this is about the people because the country is in huge debt. And when the country is in debt, so of course the people's life will matter. And energy is perhaps uh, the core to you, all you, the uh, basic entitlements. Can I ask the second question? No, first one first. Okay, yeah. you know, let's see if you have. You, know, you are absolutely right. You know, energy is a sector which is uh, uh, becoming an Achilles heel uh, for Bangladesh. Uh, Pakistan is also having the same problem. You know, they went for uh, huge investment in the energy sector, fossil-based energy sector, and uh, uh, through the uh, IPPs, they call it independent power plants, you know, and uh, most of these power plants are given to the chosen ones. You know, I'll not explain who are the chosen ones. And uh, they charge a price uh, which is very high, you know, not always market cost, you know. And the funding uh, they get uh, either from, uh, uh, you know, foreign countries like China or uh, uh, India, uh, but also uh, uh, they need to uh, 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 give back the payment in dollars. Can you imagine someone producing electricity, selling it in Bangladesh, and the payment has to be done in dollars, even a Bengali entrepreneurs. So that was a wrong decision, I would say that. You know, and the public banks or the other banks uh, they they invested there, and uh, at some point in time there was a dollar crunch, as you know. You know, suddenly the dollar uh, got appreciated by 38 percent. Taka got depreciated by 38 percent, and that cost, you know, huge cost. Who will give that guarantee? So many of them got stuck, as as you said, and uh, uh, this will be very difficult uh, because we need. We, we need to get the money. So IMF, World Bank, and others are coming forward with extra money uh, to give the budget support. But these are the funds uh, uh, guaranteed by the government again will be in trouble. And, and uh, I think we should avoid this kind of, rather, as you said, we should go for more rooftop solutions. We should go for more green energy solutions. Even the highway roads can be all penalized. Even the, you know, you know, the river uh, uh, areas can be solar paneled, you know. So there are a lot many other ways of uh, having long-term finance. Say uh, 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 8.1 million liters diesel can be saved if we go for just solar irrigation pumps. So I thought these are small things, but this is possible. Uh, but we made a mess in terms of this IPPs. And uh, uh, Bangladesh is really on a risky ground on energy. If we cannot pay them back, they will uh, not pay you back. And many a times they, they really produced electricity, uh, they got the payment. But in many times they didn't you know, uh, supply the electricity because the demand was not there from the other one, but they still got the money even not supplying. So these are the kind of anomalies that uh, still prevail in the, in the uh, energy sector. And Bangladesh or Pakistan energy sector is still uh, in, a, in a difficult situation. And that's why from the day one, I thought we should go green. You will be happy to know in as early as 2009-10, we had the largest panel in the central bank roof. And the governor's office was green energized. So one should really start on that. Thank you. If we can be quick. Uh, yeah, that's a very quick question. Since you said that like local entrepreneurs, they have to pay back in dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but my uh, understanding about Bangladesh is like, Bangladesh is very rigid. The banking sector, uh, you were the governor, you were the head of the banking system. Why is it so restricted about these international transa transactions? even for personal transaction. For example, like um, in single transaction, not, I mean, m sending money internationally or expanding your credit card internationally, it's kind of, the limit, expenditure limit is very, very because, tiny. Because we don't have enough reserve. You know, that yeah. is the reason, you know, because- yeah. uh, But also we, that, that the transaction channels, why isn't being no, developed- This, this has been eased a lot because we didn't have the digitization. That's why it, it really started 
uh, uh, becoming very hard. But the ones we got digitized, RTGS and others, things have become easier now. Uh, but even then, now that you know, reserve has gone down, mm -hmm. mainly because of the you know, you know, high cost of import mm -hmm. and also because of the mismanagement of, of the, uh, 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 some of the sectors and the post-COVID you know, sudden uh, demand for more import, you know, the reserve has gone down. But uh, 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 so uh, the, the banks had to be strict in terms of really providing more money to the individuals, actually. And even the school banking, in, in fact, the education uh, uh, support for the students were restricted at some point in time. I thought it was not needed. You know, a few million dollars we could still, uh, you know, provide to the students. And that really created huge problem for the students, you know. Even the students were denied dollars to, say, uh, apply for SWAS. But the thing is, like, the reserve is low, that, that couldn't be a possible ground to limit people's own money to spend wherever they want, whereas the country completely failed to, to prevent those money laundering. That's we, true. We have that's seen true. That that's legal why I channel. Said, yeah, that these, are, these are political economic problems. You know, this is not banking. This is a political economic problem, political structure, power structure involved. And, uh, uh, and I think... Uh, this is not only true for Bangladesh, but for many countries. You know, the, so uh, uh, this is this, uh, if you if you really have strong governance in the in the in the banking sector, and uh, with uh, credible directors and independent directors, I would call it, uh, more independent directors in the banking system would have addressed some of these problems. I didn't have much problem during my period. Our reserve was growing every year, four to five billion dollars around that time. So I didn't face this. Exchange rate was in a, in a stable. If we just look at 2009 to 16, you know, say so the old stable uh, indicators. So I thought once you are stable, you can do many innovations. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can continue the discussion over drinks. So let me thank you again for a very insightful talk. It has been an honor for the department to have you here. And uh, yeah, we are very glad that SOAS had an impact on your thing and that you, you made an impact. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thank thanks you.